I want to open up my phone, whenever I want to log into emails, in fact, whenever I want to log into my bank account, I found that my life is being ruled by passwords. Not just passwords, you know, if you want to get into your car to go somewhere, you need the password to get into it, don't you? The password is the, the key. The key to get into your car. Don't you? And you know, if you want to go into work, you, you might have to unlock a door. If, if you want to log onto your device or anything like that, sometimes even if you need to log into your Bible, if you've got that on the phone, you need a password. And passwords are governing our lives. I fear the day where I lose where all my passwords are saved. Anyone else get that feeling? Yes. You know, when that happens, we are all kaput, aren't we? But, but I have been in that situation. Anyone else ever been in the situation where, where you've put your password in? And it says, incorrect password, you have three attempts remaining. Yeah. Yeah. Try it again. You try and maybe did a, just a little typo. Incorrect password again, two attempts remaining. And now you're really starting to pray. Because if you don't get it right the next time, you are barred out of it for the next however long a period. But I, I want to talk about passwords a little bit this morning. Let me put this first verse up on the, on the screen. It comes from Matthew. Man, that is small. It says this, Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So that's our first verse. Second verse comes from Philippines. Philippines chapter 3, verse 17 says this. I can put it up there. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. I want to do a series with you and I'm going to start it this week. And the title of it is this, Passwords and Patterns. Passwords and patterns. You see, behind every password that you and I enter, there's a whole new world to discover. Behind every password that you enter, maybe on your phone or your emails, there's a whole world that lies behind it that you have that you can enjoy. Let me give you an example. You put the keys into your car. You put the password, the key into your car. You can drive in it. You can go for miles and miles anywhere you want. You've got the password. But when you use that password to drive that car, there, are, there is a pattern that you have to follow in order to get where you're going. There's a pattern that you and I have to adopt in order to obey the rules of the road and to drive that car safely and securely and to get it to where we're going. Let me give you another example of a password and a pattern. You start a new job. You go for the interview, you pass the interview, great. You've got the password, you've unlocked the new job, you're into it, you're into a new work environment, you're getting paid, you're meeting new people, you've got a sense of purpose in life, you've got the password. But in that working environment, there will be a pattern for you to follow. There will be a set of procedures that you have to go through. There will be a set of principles and, and guidelines that you have to use in order to get on in that workplace. If you don't follow that set pattern, you might not have a job for very long. You might have got the password, but the boss might come and say, hey, you're not doing things how they're meant to be done around here. See you later. We're terminating your contract. You, you can get your keys to the car and you've got the password. You can go into it. But you go into it and you don't follow the rules of the, of the land in terms of the road, then guess what? Your license could be done. You're finished. You can't do it. And you know what? It's the same in the Christian life. God gives us passwords. God gives us principles to build into our life. And he gives us patterns in how to put them into operation so that we can enjoy everything that God has for us. I hear people sometimes, they say to me, oh, I just, the Christian life, it didn't work for me. It didn't work for me. And what they mean by that is they had the password. You know, they got so far. But the pattern that they put in place wasn't the right pattern, because they couldn't stick the course. The pattern that they had, the example that they were following, broke down because they, they, they couldn't put the right pattern in place for their life to build a strong and a stable and a secure foundation for their Christian walk. 
So we're going to look at pattern, passwords and patterns over the next few weeks. And I'm going to put my first password up for you this morning that I want us to look at. Romans 12, this one, says this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing. This is your true and proper worship. The first password that I want to give you in this series is this. Surrender. Surrender. When you hear that word, I wonder what goes through your mind. You think, oh man, he wants us to surrender something else. Oh man, if I become a Christian, does that mean that I've got to give up all the good things in my life? Does that mean I've got to become a monk and stay indoors and read my Bible for 10 hours a day and do all that sort of thing? And the answer is no. But it is true, there are some things that you might have to give up if, you, if Jesus is part of your life. Things that you'll have to surrender. Matthew chapter 16 verse 24 says this. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Can I say, when we see something like that, instruction from Jesus, it should be like in our heads, ding, 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 password alert, because Jesus has given us a key. Jesus has given us a key into his life. Jesus has given us a key into the kingdom of God and how that operates and how it works. He's saying, whoever wants to follow me, which hopefully we all do, whoever wants to follow me and be my disciple must deny himself. Must deny themselves and take up their cross. Jesus has given us a password and a pattern into the life that we can live and we should be living. What are some of the things that you and I might have to surrender in our lives? There will be probably be different, might be different things that the disciples had to dis- surrender 2,000 years ago. But for you and me, let me say, we might have to surrender our agendas. Some of us might have to surrender some of our ambitions and some of our dreams. If we're going to take up the cross and follow Jesus. Hey, another one that we might have to surrender is our independence. Our independence. Who likes to do their own thing in life? You know, chart my own course, go my own way. Well, Rob, I'm just a lone ranger. I do my own thing. I want to I wanna go my own way in life. I, I don't need church. I don't need to do I want to be a Christian, but I want to go my own way. Let me find my own path. Let me find happiness for myself. Can I say, I don't think that's the way that Jesus teaches us how to live a surrendered life. Because we've got to surrender our independence. God calls us to be part of community. God calls us to be family. God calls us to be disciplined and committed in our walk with him. I found this quote. Bonhoeffer said this. I thought, wow. When Jesus calls a man, he bids him come and die. Anyone been a Christian for a while and realise the things in their life, some things have to die. Some things you have to let go of. Some things in life you might have to walk away from. They could be friendships. They could even be career paths. They could be dreams that you once had. But because God is calling you in a certain direction, you've got to let some stuff go. Because God is wanting you to walk with him and he's got his way planned out for you. There will be things in your life that you have to say no to. In our house for a little while, when we took the big step of faith and we got a dog. We got a dog. We, we, we had a little West Highland Terrier for a period of time, and as you can see, it didn't end too well by the tone of my voice. We had a dog, he was called Snowy, and Snowy was so lovely, you know, he was white, although he didn't stay that way for very long. He, he was white, he was, he was cute, although he didn't stay that way for very long. And you know, every time we took him out on a walk for a, for a, on, a, on a lead, he, he was, we were training him. You know, I mean, we trained him on this lead. And every time we went out, Snowy would want to go in one direction, and I'd want to go in the direction. You know, he, he, he'd see a butterfly, and he'd be up in the air chasing it, wanting to put, go after the butterfly. He'd see a car go past us, and before long, he was at the wheels of the car. When we, we'd be walking up the road, and there'd be a leaf going through the air, and the leaf was all that mattered to Snowy. He wanted it. He was involved in a fight with me, you know, he was wanting to do one thing, I'd point him back this way, say, Snowy, stay close to me, stay on your lead, stay close. He wanted to go his own direction. 
And you know what? In our Christian life, does it ever feel like it can be like that with God? Yeah. You know, you can want to say, God, come on, I want to do this over here. God, I want to be this person. I want to do this, I want to do that. And yet God is just saying, no, stay by my side. God, look at that. Wow, wouldn't I love to have that? would be great. You know what? God says, just keep walking with me. Keep trusting in me. God, God, do this. Please do this, do this, do this. God said, just, it's about daily walking with me. Don't get excited by the lights. Just be consistent in your walk and your daily routine. With me. Trust and put your faith in me and I'll take care of those things. So surrender, folks. But... I, I want to look at some, maybe some things that we have to surrender to, um, and what, why we surrender. First thing is this. Surrender is our response to the mercy of God. You know, in, in that verse that, that we read at the start, where was it? Da, 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 da. It's to, Romans 12. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of what? In view of God's power? In view of God's strength, in view of God's all-knowing, all-seeing, being, and all-doing, everything, the way he controls the world, the world, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. It doesn't say that. It says, in view of God's mercy, submit your bodies as a living sacrifice. You know, when two nations come together, or a group of nations come together, and they're, 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 they're about to begin a conflict... You know, those nations, often they, they bring their troops together uh, and they, they'll bring the tanks, they'll bring armaments, they'll bring weaponry, they'll, they'll bring all they can against the other nation. Uh, and, and the goal of, of, of the war is, is to try and get, is to overpower the nation. And, and if they can, they, they'll want the other nation, the other country to submit. They'll want the other country to surrender, you know, to, to wave the white flag and say, we give up, you can come and do what you want to us. Take our goods, take our cities, do what you want. That they want the soldiers to, to, to lay down their weapons and put their hands up in the air and say, I surrender. I surrender. You can have your way. You can come and take over us. But you see, with God, it's not like that. He doesn't say, I'm all-powerful, I'm omniscient, I'm omnipotent, I'm everything that I could ever be. Now submit to me, now surrender. In view of God's mercy, we offer our bodies as living sacrifice. Who's God to surrender? When we know, folks, what God is like, I tell you what, it makes it so much easier to Surrender. The Bible paints a clear picture of what our God is like, what his nature is, his attributes, how he's performed in the past, if you like. What sort of God is he? Psalm 103, in case you're in doubt, says this, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbour his, his anger forever. Psalm 130 says this, If you, Lord, kept a record of our sins, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness so that we can, with reverence, serve you. Doesn't that make it easier to submit? Doesn't that make it easier to surrender to God, knowing that he's a God who is full of compassion and graciousness? Now I came across someone I was doing, going to the recycling centre yesterday. Uh, and there's a gentleman there that I talk, I, I know, and it's from town, and I talk to every now and again. And he said, he knows that I'm a minister of the church, and he said, well, we, we were in work the other day, and some people came to me and they said, well, what's God like? What's he like? And I, and, and I thought, oh, man, <laughs> this could be a tough one. What's God like? You know, he's got all these people in his work waiting for an answer. He's got all these people like that. Like, well, they, they, they build it up to this question, what are they meant to say? How, what's he, what should he tell them? And I thought, actually, I can deal with that one. It's okay. <laughs> I can handle that. I said, if we want to know what God is like, the God who holds the universe in his hand, we just have to look to Jesus. We just have to look at how Jesus lived in this world to know what God is like. He said, yeah, well, they, they talk about all the wars that have been committed in God's name. I say, well, the wars, they might have been made in God's name, but it wasn't God who initiated it. Human beings get things wrong, folks. Human beings take countries to war. Sin leads to war. But can I say, 
God, Jesus, is our example. If we want to know what God is like, folks, open up your Bible and see how he dealt with people who accused him. See how he dealt with people who were taunting him on the cross. See how he dealt with people who didn't deserve his love. That's what our God is like. And when we realize what God is like, when we realize his nature, when we realize his heart towards you and to me, you know what, I'm ha quite happy to raise the white flag of surrender in my life. When I realize that God is full of grace and mercy and compassion, I'm quite happy to say, to hold my hands up and say, Lord, I surrender to you. You come in and take every area of my life, be in control of every aspect of it, because God, you are gracious, you are compassionate, you are full of mercy, in view of God's mercy, I surrender. Or would you come in and would you have your way? But a surrender is our response to the mercy of God, but also this, surrender... We have to surrender to who Jesus is. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, he goes to his disciples and he says, who do people say I am? You know, who do people out there say I am? And they say, well, some people think you're Elijah. Some people think you're, you're, you're just a prophet. Some people think that, that you're, you're Jeremiah, you're a good man. Some people will always think all these things. But then Jesus goes a little bit deeper. He digs underneath the surface and he puts them on the spot. Anyone here like being put on the spot? No, some of you are shaking your head. No, 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 no. Being put on the spot. And Jesus says to them, yes, but who do, I know what everyone else says, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? And Peter says this, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. See, who you say Jesus is determines how you surrender. Maybe God, Jesus is just a good person. Maybe Jesus is a distant God. Maybe Jesus is someone who's far away, not ever had an impact on your life. But when we realize that Jesus is the son of the living God, and we've accepted him into our life, it's a fox. It makes it that much easier to surrender and lay down our cause for him. Thomas was another example. Thomas wouldn't believe that Jesus had risen. Thomas was doubting. Thomas said, unless I see the nails in his hands, I, I, I won't believe it. And Jesus came to him and he showed him what he'd done. He showed him that he had nail-pierced hands. And then Thomas says these words, my Lord and my God. Thomas realized that Jesus was who he said he was. Hey, listen, surrender came far easier to Thomas when he knew and he surrendered to who Jesus was. The surrender, I want to say, it's a double, it's a double, it's a double punch. It's a double tap on the on the mouse. If you like it, last night's fight between Fury and White, it was Fury's double punch that finished Dylan White off. What a punch can I say to finish him off? It was horrendous. It was it was brutal. But it was a one-two punch that Jesus calls us to walk into. Jesus says, Jesus says this, if, or actually in Romans, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus says, Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You've got to speak it, and you've got to believe it from your heart. You can speak out a lot of things, folks. You can say, yes, I believe. You can say, yes, I go to church. You can come to church every Sunday, week in, week out. But unless it's a heart issue, unless it's outward and it's an inward work, then surrender is ever so difficult. It, that will determine if you trust him enough to put your hope, your trust in him. You know, on, our, on the news of late, there's so much talk about Russia and Ukraine and President Putin, President Zelensky. But President Putin has been in charge of Russia for a long, long period of time. He came to power a number of years ago, and there was a rule in the Russian constitution that said he could only be president for eight years, I think it's eight years. And after eight years, President Vladimir Putin had to step down and step back. And because Putin wanted to control what was going on in the Kremlin and in Russian society, he appointed one of his cronies. He appointed a guy called Dmitry Medvedev to be president for a period of four years. He came into power, and after those four years, guess what happened? Surprise, surprise, President Putin was back in the main spot as president, being able to do what he wanted. 
But during that time of four years when, pres when, pre when President Dmitry Medvedev was in power, the story goes that Medvedev and Putin got into a car. And because Medvedev was the president, the guy in charge, he got into the driving seat of the car. President Putin, with some other leaders of the country, had to get into the seats in the back. And when President um, Medvedev got into the driving seat, he put his hands on the steering wheel and he realised the steering wheel wouldn't turn. He realised that although he had his hands on the steering wheel of the car, it was completely ineffective. Behind him, in the seats behind, President Putin had a control and could control the car from the back seat of the car. You see, what looked like to be in charge, what looked like the person who was in control actually wasn't. And the President Putin behind was the one calling the shots. And I wonder in your life and in my life, how much surrender do we really give to God? I wonder if we say, God, I surrender this part of my life to you. But over here, I'm not quite sure if I'm ready to relinquish control. I wonder if over here, I say, yeah, God, I'm willing to trust you with my future. But now, I'm not so sure I'm going to hold on to the steering wheel of my life and not put you in the driving seat. I wonder if over here, you say, yes, I'm a Christian. And yes, I need God. And yes, I need forgiveness of my sins. But over here you say, I'm not willing to let go of my past. I'm not willing to move on. I'm not willing to trust God in this area. Folks, surrender is not a half-hearted thing. It can be, but it's just a waste of time. You may as well hold on to the reins. Hold on to the reins so they can't do what you want. But can I encourage you? Let go of the reins. Surrender to God. And put him in charge. And one th final thing I want to say about surrender is this. Surrender is all we can offer. In that passage I read at the start, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, this is your true and proper worship. What can you and I give a God who's got it all? What can you and I give to God who owns everything in the, in the universe? What can you and I give to a God who knows the beginning from the end? What can you and I give to a God who, who shaped the mountains and formed the valleys? Who put together the plants and all the animals in this world? Do you know what we can give him? Our hearts. We can surrender our hearts. In this church, listen, let me tell you, we love to sing. That's why we do it. We love to pray. That's why we do it. We love to tithe. That's why we do it. We love to fast. That's why we spend time in prayer and fasting. But unless we're submitting our hearts and surrendering our hearts to God, the rest of it have very little substance. The singing, the praying, the coming has very little substance to God. It's our hearts that he wants. The old Christmas carol says this, what can I give him poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. Yet, what I can I give him? I give him my heart. The currency of heaven, folks, is not what you earn. The currency of heaven is not how you look. The currency of heaven is your heart towards God and towards his kingdom. Let's stand to our feet. I'm just going to invite the musicians to come back up and we're going to finish off with one more song. It's a song called I Surrender All, All to G Thee, my blessed Saviour. I Surrender All. You know, like the blessed version of, uh, of Romans 12, it says this. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life you're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, and you're walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for him. You know, I wonder here this morning, perhaps you're not sure who Jesus is even. You're not sure what he's like. Can I say, the journey towards getting to know what God is, Jesus is like, is opening up your heart and saying, Jesus, I need you. Would you come into my soul? Would you forgive me of the things I've done wrong and wash me clean and give me a new start? 
Maybe other people here this morning to say, God, I've surrendered 50% of my life to you, but I'm holding on to the rest of it because I don't fully trust and I don't really know what will be around the corner if I let go of everything. Can I just say this morning, I just want to encourage you, take your hands off the steering wheel and let God come into the driving seat of your life and surrender to him. Just bow our heads and pray.